Hi, um, so I'm Joe Gardner. So um, this is going to be a what would have been a physical tour of the test bed and demonstration if we were in Bristol um, for the Coppins, but now I've converted this into a presentation uh, with lots of pictures, lots of videos. So you'll at least get an idea of what you would have seen if you walked around, if you were here. So just so I am, so I'm an RA in the cybersecurity group. I've actually been here two years this week. I'm going to start on 1st September 2018. Um, so my main job involves running all these test beds and managing. So I came in sort of halfway through the build of these and then been happy with that since then. Um, it's a long term process. And now I run the test beds and I run experimentation on them. So when we do work with this test bed, I'll figure out how we actually go and do that with these, as well as doing more general research around ICS security on this. Uh, and I'm also currently finishing my PhD up at Lancaster as well. We'll focus on software defined networks. Uh, obviously, I'm not the only person involved in this. This is a big test bed and has a lot of people involved. So, on the academic side, we have uh, Barney Craggs, uh, Ben Green, myself, Arais Rashid, and Ben Shreve, who've all helped. And then we have our team of engineers, uh, Don, Chris, Simon, Nick, David, and Matt, uh, who have all helped with the building of this. Uh, we have a lot of engineer help with getting these up built and maintained and working. So, what we're going to cover in this talk today. So, we're going to have a virtual tour of our BCSG Cyber Physical Systems Testbed, uh, which involves the ICS side, the management, IoT. And then once I've shown that, uh, we're going to do a demonstration of an attack on the testbed. Um, so this is an attack that Awais talked about at last year's Quotas event. Uh, and I'm going to give the practical demonstration of that. Uh, I'm hoping to stick about 40 minutes and I have plenty of time for Q&A. I mean, myself, uh, Awais is going to be here for most of that and Barney here too as well, so he can also chime in with answers. So before we go into the test bed, we'll first talk about what we actually want to use this for. So we have five key use cases for research on this test bed. Uh, the first and primary one that we've looked at so far is convergence between IT and operational technology, so OT spaces, and especially when you start introducing IoT and industrial IoT into these environments which are blurring the boundaries between the IoT and OT networks. Uh, and that's what our demo, the demo today is going to show. Uh, we also then perform security analysis of ICS and I, IoT devices and the software behind them. Uh, our first two vulnerabilities are going to be announced by the vendor, hopefully on Tuesday, um, if all goes to plan. Uh, we look at designing and breaking intrusion detection systems within converged IoT and OT networks. Uh, the test for abuse for quite extensive data set generation. So, we have extensive data capture capability on this test bed on the network. Uh, and so when we run attacks on this, on our systems, we can generate test beds to then share with the wider community afterwards. And as we mentioned briefly in other parts, uh, we do a lot of human factors work in the group. So we do human factors work with the ICE environment. So for example, uh, we have one PSU student who just finished and she was looking at uh, operators under pressure. So if the operator is running this environment and they get attacked, uh, they a cyber attack, how do they react? How can they keep calm in that situation? And to allow this research to happen, uh, we have five main design and build principles that we followed. Uh, we want diversity of devices, so we're not focused on any single manufacturer's devices. Uh, we have lots of manufacturers and we have both new and old equipment. So we've got the latest, greatest devices and also devices that are 20 years old uh, and uh, vulnerable to every single attack possible. Uh, we have it support for scalability, so the test bed at the moment is the current size, but it's quite easy to extend this uh, by adding new devices in or by linking up to our test beds. Uh, and if we need to uh, reduce costs, we can also simulate and virtualize environments as well. Uh, we've tried to make it as simple as possible to use, so we've tried to reduce the complexity of the test bed uh, for deploying VMs. So we have special networks that allow us to access this test bed without having to go and physically plug cables in. Uh, we can do all of that virtually. Uh, we have extensive data capture, so we've designed it from the ground up to be able to capture data at any point um, in the test bed. So whatever research we're doing, we can capture the network traffic as and when we need to. And quite important one for us uh, is the safety of the researchers. So we have lots of physical equipment here. Uh, we have water plants, we have lots of electrical stuff. Um, we need to make sure it's safe for researchers to use and technicians around this stuff, the equipment. So our test bed, um, this is built to a published reference architecture. I have a link to this at the end in the last slide. So this was developed by Barney, uh, Chris Hanking and others uh, as a reference architecture for the security test bed. So 
this is kind of the baseline of where we built this from in the first place. We have multiple physical and virtual processes. So the primary one is water treatment plant, you see up there. Uh, we also have a factory and various other virtual processes we can use. This is all very much vendor agnostic. So we have multiple manufacturers equipment. Currently, most of our stuff runs on Siemens. Uh, base that just happens because we have most of Siemens equipment. Uh, but we can quite easily switch aside to any vendor as and when we need to. We have a full realistic corporate IT and OT network behind this, uh, which has been fully realized. And we also use real-world top-end software as well. So in our operation center, um, we have all the software that you would need to run in this and can be deployed anywhere in the test bed. So this is a brief overview of the network infrastructure that we use. So you can see there's sort of three main networks that we have in here. The first one is experimental network, and this is what allows us to do the research. So this is actually used in any of the day-to-day -day running of the test bed in terms of the software talking to devices and so on. This is just there for us to be able to access the test bed and research. Management network is a network that allows us, if you're on that network, you can basically access any part of the testbed network. So, uh, for example, all of our service VMs are mounted to this as well. So from our operation center, we can go and log remote desktop into any VM as and when we need to. Well, they have to go and plug a cable around to give us access on there. Uh, and we also have the spanning network, uh, which will allow us to do network taps. So that covers um, and is separate to the main testbed network and is a, a mirror that we can then go and capture data from any of these individual points within the network. We don't have the IT test bed. Uh, at the moment, this is mainly just the switches and routers. We don't really have many services running on this because we haven't focused too much on IT yet. Uh, but that is fully realized and we can go and plug services into there as and when we need to. And then the big one, the most important one is the OT test bed network. So this is all based around four field sites at the moment. Field site one is our water plant that is currently operational. Uh, field site two is currently being built as we speak. Uh, field site three is for a future third process and our mobile uh, field site slash demo box, uh, which connects over 4G connection into our test bed. This entire network is isolated from the university. Uh, the only access is only is through a VPN and a 4G radio connection uh, provided by a partner. So that's our network side. Uh, this is fully isolated, um, so only we have access network, it's not in our server room, and there's only a few cables that go out that room, two of them into our SOC, and one out to the VPN access. Uh, this is fully realized with Cisco switches and routers, so we have built this network, it's fully operational, it's no aspect of the network itself is virtualized, um, but each of these individual networks do have a VLAN assigned, which means we can go and assign VMs to them quite easily. Uh, if you look at that video picture there, you see all those orange cables. Each orange cable is one network tap. And there's one of those on every single point of that network. So about 50% of our cabling is just for capturing data on this network. Uh, and as you can see in the bottom picture here, this is my SDN test bed. Uh, I'm currently building a software defined version of this network stack. So we'll be able to flip over from any of the individual networks, all the networks over to S and control uh, so we can go and see how that works for both new attacks using SDN and also building new defenses. So these are three Dell open networking 48 volt switches, um, which can be left up to sort of generic open flow controllers. And also a second virtualization server for deploying services and controllers. And this little server down the bottom here is quite a small one, uh, but that is a extra utility server. So if we have an external partner who wants to deploy something, uh, we can use that as a host for their services. So we had a partner who was going to install an IDS system, um, which unfortunately fell through, uh, but that would have hosted their top end, so we kept separate from our network on there. Uh, for all our services, so all our services are virtualized. Um, this is just because so we don't have to go and have physical machines, so we don't have to have space to have lots and lots of machines around to host servers. Uh, so all our services are hosted inside VMs uh, using vSphere. Uh, and all of our network VLANs are mapped to the server. So very easily using vSphere, we can take a VM and connect it to any of our test bed networks quite easily. So this allows very easy deployment. If you can spin up a VM in minutes and connect to any part of the network, so if you want to carry a VM to go and test something, that is very quick to do. And like I said, all of these VMs are connected to our management network. So we can use remote desktop and all these VMs from our central location or from a job box for remote partners. Uh, so you don't have to go and 
connect to different networks or different VPNs to get to them. You can just connect to the network and get to your VM as and when you need. So for the remote access, so we do have a dedicated VPN. Um, the VPN gives you access to everything inside currently the entire network. Uh, we are currently working on the shut that down to be allow certain partners to have certain access to certain subnets. Uh, the test bed has been designed to allow field sites to be linked to our top end. So we have our top end of all our services on our network. Uh, if you have a field site, you can connect your field site to our network and use our top end for experimentation. And vice versa, uh, you can use our field site and we can connect our field site to your top end uh, so we can collaborate on different projects and make the test bed potentially extremely large. And we'll talk about more at the end how we can do that. So we'll now go on to sort of the more interesting part, which is the physical processes. So this is kind of our headline process, which is our Gun C five at one water treatment plant. So this is something we bought off the shelf. Um, Barney did try and build his own, but he realized it was going to be too difficult um, and was probably going to flood our office. So we bought this from a company called Gunt, and they sell these as trainers for water treatment engineers. So this comes with a big book. If you put the right chemicals in and you take the right samples, this will give you drinkable water at the other side. Uh, we just fit with tap water, and since it's the far so I would not recommend drinking it, uh, but it would work if you put the right chemicals in. Uh, it's a three-stage process, so there's three sets of tanks. First is filtration, um, then we have absorption, and then we have ion exchange over those three stacks. Uh, we did make a few modifications to this, so, and I'll show you these in the next slide in more detail. Uh, we did add a removal pipe so we can add sensors quite easily, and we did add some extra safety mechanisms, so if we do overpressurize it, it won't blow up. And we basically took their control cabinet they provided, which has a very basic PLC. Um, we ripped out all the connections and then put it off to our own control architecture. So this is how it looks in a bit more detail. So, so these are the three stages here. So we have the filtration, so this is gravel and sand. Absorption, this is aluminum oxide and activated carbon. And then I'll show you some magic process I don't understand. Um, we have the two input tanks, so this is the dirty water tank, which is just tap water in our case. Oh, sorry, this is the dirty water tank, this is the clean water tank, and that is where the main pump is located. This has one single pump that pushes all the water through the system, and a set of these electronic valves, uh, which are digitally controlled, which can open and close and let the water go through the different processes. And there are also a few sensors, so we have a uh, temperature sensor here, there's a few pressure sensors around, and this is a pressure alarm here. These up here, we have our safety release valves. These are one of the things we added. So if this system goes above about two bar of pressure, uh, those are open and they'll let the water go back out into our uh, clean water tank. That just means that if we do ever pressurize it, which we have done before, uh, we don't cause any damage to the system or it's flooding. The other modification we made is this copper pipe in the middle. Uh, so this is usually just a straight past it pipe. Uh, but we have here this pipe that we can physically uh, disconnect the deeper end and remove, and then if we want to put a new pipe in there, we can go and mount different sensors and actuators and so on into there quite easily without having to go and take out plastic pipe. Uh, we also have some other safety mechanisms we put in, so we've put it on top of these giant buttons. Um, these don't hold enough water to be able to hold all of this, uh, but hopefully if it does leak or if somebody opens the tap, uh, this will stop us flooding our kitchen, because it's in our coffee area. Um, and also inside our control cabinet, we have a little Arduino-based safety mechanism. So if we have some sensors in the button down here, if any water goes into there, it will turn the power off to the pump. So it will stop pumping water through because these buttons should hold enough water to what sits in these tanks. And if there's lots of pumping out, if these empty, we can contain that. Uh, we have a little wireless HMI on the side here. This is Siemens um, wireless HMI. Uh, and this is the Original control cabinet, this HMI no longer does anything, it's just there for show. Uh, and you can see these great cables that come down here and off through the ceiling. Uh, that's our new control architecture. So inside there, it's a mess uh, of replaced cables and movable terminals. And now all the control and all the sensors now get muted into our alternate room. Uh, I want to show you briefly how this looks with the pressure alarm. So the pressure alarm over here uh, is set physically to at 1.7 bar, it activates an alarm. And then in the logic of the PLC, uh, if that is hit, it will turn off the pump and it will wait until it goes down below 1.3 bar. So you can see that operating here. So here we're running at 80% pump capacity. 
if we add that pump speed, we will bake that 1.7 bar limit. You can see pump shuts off. We will wait until it goes down to below 1.2, and then it will activate. And it will keep doing this until we reduce the pump speed down because it will just keep over pressurizing and going down. When we usually run this demo, uh, that's what we directly attack. We override that alarm, and then this pressure goes up to 1.8 bar. Uh, the pump's not that powerful, so we're not going to do any damage. With this is shown there, we bypass that safety mechanism. So it cuts out, does it? Uh, the next process, which I really hoped we'd have working today and be able to show you, but unfortunately, due to engineers being ill and limited access to our lab, um, it's probably going to be ready next week instead. Um, so this is a multi-stage manufacturing process from a company called Fischer Technik in Germany. Uh, it looks like Lego. It is not Lego. It is much more fragile than Lego is. Um, and this is a four stage process. So we have a sorting warehouse over here. So we have little colored blocks and this will pick and place them with this little arm mechanism. Uh, we have this robot arm in the middle which moves the box around. An open process over here and this is a little sorting process here which sorts the box out. And then the arm will pick them up from here, put them back in the warehouse at the end. So it runs in a cycle with the box around. We also use a virtual process called Factorio, which many of you may have seen before. Um, just a quick code of real games, and we use this extensively for teaching purposes and also for prototyping as well. Uh, this lets you build quite large scale simulations of mostly manufacturing based processes, um, and you can directly control this with real world devices. So for Siemens and Alan Bradley devices, uh, you can connect them over Ethernet. It's all done as remote IO, uh, so you don't need to do any actual wiring, uh, but then you can write logic and control the process of the PLC, as you can see down in this little video down here. Um, this is the basic process we use for our winter school teaching and the appropriate logic, and these are linked up. Uh, it can also talk to Modbus devices, so it has a Modbus server as well, so if you have something like uh, Open PLC on a Raspberry Pi, uh, this can talk to that as well. And you can also use this to inject faults um, into its efforts, so you can go about PLC, if you make something faulty, you can do that in the program. Um, you can also connect this to other devices. So if you have a certain USB device, a USB data logger, you can use that as physical I.O. to put this into any PLC or any other device if you wanted to as well. Um, so this is our main control board uh, that we use for controlling that water plant. So those great cables that went out through the ceiling, uh, they come into our server room where we have uh, three, now three of these boards in there and the cables come into this architecture. And this has been designed for us to be able to easily A, wire stuff in and also swap stuff out as we need to. So this is part of our reference architecture. Um, all our posters will be run to exactly the same spec. Uh, you'll see in the next photo how these look on the wall now. Um, this is very flexible, so we can use this to any physical process. As long as you can put those wires out for the ceiling, we can connect those processes. And also we can add lots and lots of different devices onto this. There's lots of space for mounting things on there. Uh, it's quite safe, so down here we have all our power supply, so all of our 240 volt supplies um, are locked inside this box, so we can't touch them because uh, our engineers don't trust us very much. Um, so everything on this board is safe 24 volts, so if somebody goes in here, they're not going to hurt themselves. Um, we also have dead comes on the board, so we have down here an industrial switch. Um, here we have a checkpoint firewall, and we also here for the wireless HMI, we're using a 20 pound microtic access point. Uh, it's cheap and it works. It saves us spending 200 pounds on the Siemens one. So on this board here, this is our water plant control. Uh, the main device we have is a Siemens uh, 1500 PLC. Uh, that is what controls pretty much every operation of that water plant and reads all the sensor values. Uh, this is the brand new device. Uh, and this is our legacy ET200S device. It's now longer manufactured. Um, we actually get this and these are now very expensive to buy because they are used for stock. They're very extensive to use in industry. Uh, and that turns the pump on and off. So this controls the pump speeds and everything else. This just turns on and off the pump. Uh, and this has just been replaced because we managed to break it and destroy the power supply. Uh, this is a SCADA pack 32, 32 RDU from Schneider. Uh, so that is receiving data from the 1500 PLC and pulling it off to our SCADA environment on the top end. And the rest here is all the IO. So this is all our IO terminals linking out to the process uh, by a swap terminal. So if you want to change this PLC, we just unscrew this plate. Uh, we can remove the whole uh, mounting off. 
unplug all these terminals, put a new one on, plug the terminals up. It's a day's work instead of taking weeks to wire this up. This takes a very long time to build. This is how the room looks at the moment. Um, this was taken on Tuesday when I was in. Uh, so this is that board you see there with the water plant. Uh, this is the board for the factory. So this is going to be started wire work on Monday uh, by our engineers. Sorry about the mess. They are literally building this now. Uh, and this is the board for our third process uh, when we purchase it. Uh, for now, I'm going to turn this into a sandbox. So we'll be able to put devices up here to use uh, to test uh, and give them a access to because obviously we're limited to lab access at the moment. Uh, for our control devices, so we have lots of manufacturers covered. I'll show you the list of them in the next slide. Uh, we have both new devices, most manufacturers, and we have lots and lots of legacy devices as well, uh, because in the real world, you do get a mix of new and old devices. So we have all the sorts of PLCs, the HMIs, the RTUs, uh, industrial switches, wireless communication, uh, sensors, security appliances, all of this. We have a big cover for the boxes. Uh, so we can go and deploy all these as we need to. Uh, let's just cover some of the manufacturers that we have devices for. So, um, Polemony, Siemens, Alan Bradley are the two sort of largest manufacturers, uh, and Bockwell. Uh, we have quite a lot of Schneider, uh, including some of their new water specific devices, um, which we are probably one of the only universities anywhere to have because Barney put a lot of effort into getting the status one. Um, Honeywell, ABB, Yokogawa, Westermo, Delta, all of these we have at least a few devices for each of them being go deploy as needed. Uh, we then have our security operations centre. Uh, so this is our main way of accessing the test bed. Uh, so it's a three station stock. Uh, this is physically connected to our test bed. So there are three Ethernet cables that go from the wall ports there through the ceiling into our test bed back. Uh, it's not going in it over any university network. It's entirely self contained still. We also have a little switch in there as well, which gives us access to some of the various subnets in the test bed. So if we need to go into a particular network, uh, we can use that switch to get onto there quite easily for maintenance tasks. Uh, so again, probably this is mainly for controlling the test bed and giving us access to the VMs. Uh, but we also use this quite a lot in human-based studies. So as I said, we have a student who's looking at how operators react under pressure. Uh, we have a student who's looking at designing new interfaces for security, and she's been doing testing in here with this equipment uh, for that as well, and seeing how people react with the various programming software for these devices for configuring security. So that's how ICS work. Uh, we also have a building management system testbed, uh, which would mainly for the convergency work. So this is also in our kitchen. Um, on the wall, we have this big cabinet. Uh, that has changed, but now we do now have a lock on there. Um, so this is features both uh, the latest and leg legacy uh, trend microsystems BMS controllers. So uh, this one here is the latest, greatest new one. And the one over here is the most widely deployed bird magic controller in the UK um, and is a lot older. Both of these are black box. So we have a partner who provided these for us. Uh, they can program them, we cannot because we're not trend authorized um, service technicians. So we can only treat these as black box devices. If we want to attack them, we have to do the devices around them rather than attack those directly themselves. We have multiple sensors around this. So over here we have uh, temperature and carbon dioxide sensor, uh, and this is an air quality sensor. Over on this board here, we also have a wireless temperature sensor uh, and a, a vent door control actuator as well. But we can also plug in, so we have this tunnel back here, we can go wire every sensor into this as when we need to. Uh, the most interesting part to this is one of these two devices, I can remember which one, I believe it is this one, allows us to connect to this uh, consumer grade IoT devices. So things like Philips Hue, uh, consumer uh, security locks for doors. Uh, we can connect these to this test bed and they can become part of the BMS system. And that's quite important. So when we look at these devices which could be used, uh, and especially if they're used within a ICS environment as well, or OT environment, so your fire alarm system is in your OT connection system, but it's connected to this, uh, or your ventilation, for example, we can use this to look at the convergence on there. And then, uh, finally, for the ICS side, we have our remote field site. So this is our remote field site slash demonstration box. And this is what I'll be showing the demo on in a little while. So this is itself a fully self-contained unit. This will work by itself. Um, but we can also have a 4G radio in here. So this will connect back up to our top end over 4G 
affiliate to. Generally, don't use the 4G because it's quite a limited data plan. Uh, we tend to use laptops with this rather than allow 4G signals uh, when doing demos, but we can do that affiliate to for building that connection. It is portable. This folds down into two penny cases. It's quite heavy, but we can put it on the back of a car and take it to events on there. Uh, the main process in here is a conveyor belt. So we bought this from a company called LJ Crate, and our engineers did a brilliant job of building this into our box for us. Um, we did previously have a fish steak one. That one fell apart every time we moved it, so we built this much more robust metal-based one, which we can carry around, and it's not going to break on us on there. Um, I'll show this working in a little while. So we do take this around. So we first showed this at Cyber UK last year uh, on stage uh, as our first demo. And it's the same demo I'll be showing you today. And we also take it to smaller events. So for example, this is the two of the B-sides uh, security conferences in the UK. Um, and then we have Ben by Lego as well, which you've probably all seen before. Uh, we then have a series of devices and equipment for training and prototyping. So we have the water plant, um, but that is quite big and expensive. And if somebody breaks the water plant, they're going to flood our office, which we don't want. Um, and it's going to be a pain to replace. So we have lots of levels of equipment for training, which is made in our teaching boxes and our training bench, and also prototyping. So we have our training bench and also the work field site is used for teaching and prototyping and smaller projects. Uh, the main benefit is it's a lot lower cost. Uh, you have to replace the device on these smaller things. It's a 300 pound PLC instead of a 3,000 pound PLC. It's a much smaller learning curve. You don't have to worry about all the networking. You just have the devices there. Um, and again, that's just a flood in the office which would be bad. So our teaching boxes, uh, we have 12 of these that we've built. Um, we've entirely built these ourselves. Our engineers did a fantastic job of building these and designing them and making them work. Uh, the primary use for these are for our doctoral training center in security. So we have a module in the after Christmas uh, where we teach practically how to break and secure these devices. Uh, the current 12 boxes are all Siemens based. So they have a Siemens 1200 PLC, uh, a KTP 700 basic HMI and a Microtech router. And our engineers are in the process of building six more of these boxes that have Allen Bradley equivalent equipment. So a small Allen Bradley PLC and a small Allen Bradley HMI. Uh, these are mainly designed to work with factory IO, as I showed you a few slides ago. Uh, but we already have the physical IO for the PLCs mapped. So if you wanted to link these up to a different physical process, if we ever get them, uh, then we can do that as well. Um, and we have a little marketing router for doing networking. Uh, we use microtics quite a lot because they are cheap and they're very powerful. You can do a lot with Microtech router in terms of configuration, so they're very handy to have in these sort of environments for doing different experimentation and teaching use. We also have our training area in the lab. Um, so here we have one of our teacher boxes usually on standby, and we have these two LJ Create PLC trainers. So uh, the one over here is basically the same as our mobile demo box, but it's how they usually sell them in a nice mounted platform. And the one over here, as the video is shown down here, is a much more complex process, which is a, a testing platform. So you have these unmanufactured rectangles, which have cutouts and holes drilled, and they're made a certain thickness. And this tests the different parts of that to be measured correctly, based on the recipe, and will pass or fail them and sort them into boxes at the end. Uh, we have a desktop here that has all the configuration software we need as well, so you can go program these devices and then all of this. Um, and this is kept fully isolated from our main test bed, so none of this stuff ever connects to I mean, test bed, so whatever you do on here, you're not going to break anything. And all the stuff on this is quite easy to replace or repair if something goes wrong. Uh, and finally, the last part of our lab is our workshop. Um, this physical test bed requires quite a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of physical stuff here that needs to be wired and repaired. Um, and also needs expertise to do this. So we fund a full-time engineer um, we have a job queue that we use with our engineering, our engineering department's technician team. Um, so we have priority access to engineers. So anything we need to do for repairs or building, uh, we can get them to do that quite quickly. Um, they also help with uh, anything electrical, they're a lot better than us at doing. Uh, we shouldn't be allowed to wire stuff because we always mess it up. It always comes out. I'm notoriously bad at wiring in power supplies. Um, the engineers also help with the health and safety. So all the stuff that they build is properly tested. Um, so it's proved to be safe. And we have our own little on-site workshop. So we have a set of tools and wires and things here. We can go and build this and it's also used for prototyping. So um, 
We do stuff for Arduino, we can do all the cable making and stuff here. And we also have a 3D printer maker part, which is very handy for making things like attachments. So if we want to attach stuff to Dimbell, we have a standard model we can print as a Dimbell attachment um, and also a circuit board printer. So when we're doing more practical stuff later, um, we can go print circuit boards and things ourselves quite easily. As I said, one of our key parts is our safety. Um, so all of our equipment where anything 240 volts use is enclosed. You can't touch it uh, without usually taking a screwdriver or something to open up. So even our BMS system now, which has 240 volt, inside that cabinet, there's now a plastic sheet over this. So anything 240 volt physically you can't reach. Uh, all those control boards are in a locked room. Uh, so only certain people have access to that room. Uh, even though it's in a 24 volt, you can still get a shock if you touch the wrong tone on the block on there. Uh, we have the mentioned water rig safety mechanisms. Um, we also have, there are all the taps on there. We've physically pulled the handles off and we've used little 3D printed plugs to block off all the ends of the taps. So uh, nobody can go in and walk in and turn the tap on and then again, flood the office. Um, we did find that we do have to do regular Legionnaire testing. So when you have water, there is a Legionnaire risk on there. So we do test this regularly and we do treat the water with chlorine to keep it safe. Uh, all our staff is through training before we use anything. So before anybody touches any equipment, we show them how to use it, what's safe to touch, what's safe to touch. And all our group members understand not to touch stuff. All of this equipment, a lot of it, the water plant, the BMS system is in our coffee area. So all our group members have access to that device and can touch it. Uh, they understand not to push any buttons or open up any cabinets without asking anyone first. So when I move on to the demonstration, and I think I'm pretty much on time. So this is being shown on my field site. I did plan to do this on the water plant, um, but as I said, one of the PLCs is broken. I'm not time to reprogram it yet um, and have the access to that. Uh, so I'm using pre recorded footage we made last year alongside new screen capture. So this is all made as live, but it is pre-recorded footage from before. Uh, if you weren't quite as last year, I always did discuss this attack in his talk. Um, and this is the practical demonstration of that. So at the very high level, this is a very typical converged ICS and in industrial IT environment. So we have all of our devices down here, our PLCs, our RTUs and our HMIs. These are the physical devices in that box. And then we also have industrial IT our devices, so wireless heart, lower sensors, um, and IoT devices, so ZigBee, Z-Wave type devices in there. We then have our supervision network. So here we have our SCADA software. In this case, it's called ClearSCADA, uh, which stores these devices and does general SCADA operations. Um, and then we have our additional IT platform. So here we have a thing called Kepware, which is a data historian, um, which can communicate with IT devices and pull data off. And then we have the cloud. So this IoT uh, platforms, they pull data and push it off into the cloud. Uh, we're keeping more about Industry 4.0, SCADA in the cloud, and all this stuff. This is the practical implementation of that. Um, I'll go into detail what these all are in the next few slides. So just to cover the target environment a bit more. So this is the full view of our remote test bed for your site. Um, so it's a basic sort of conveyor process. So we have three different sized little metal uh, blocks. Uh, it measures the blocks and push them off one of three pushes. They see that happening there, not there. Uh, and the HMI screen displays the dots moving. I'm going to show a counter on this. Uh, the primary control to this is a Siemens S7-1200. Uh, that is what does all the control of this process. We also have an ET200S in the box that doesn't actually control anything. That's just there because we can break it and we use it to demonstrate attacks and reconnaissance. Uh, we have the SCADA Pack 32, which is supporting the auto state. So this process can run in auto mode or maintenance mode. In auto mode, it runs logic and does the process. In maintenance mode, you have to physically control all the individual elements. And we have a Westermo industrial switch doing the network comms inside of here. Uh, we're using two laptops for compute resources. So we're doing this entirely locally inside the box. Uh, one laptop does all the supervision network and one does the cloud. Uh, all the attacks here are carried out using a Python script that we developed over quite a long time. Um, I'll explain what most of it's doing, but no, we can't share it because it contains unreleased vulnerabilities in there. So this is an example of how this usually works in a bit more detail. You see the light bulb goes on and gets pushed out the first bucket. Uh, the medium block goes on and goes out the middle bucket. 
and we have little block as we drive at the end. And these are just two infrared sensors that are just measuring how long that block up to the sensor for and then pushes them out. And this is what the HMI screen looks like on this. You can see it doesn't specify which side of the block is, but it just shows the box moving down and being pushed off the end and updates the counters on there. So the focus equipment in this box. So we have the clear scarder, and then the key industrial IT part here is this Kepware software. Kepware is a data historian, and Kepware basically turns your PLCs and RTUs and HMIs into IoT devices, um, and then pushes that data out to the cloud to do thing works. So first off, we have clear scarder. So clear scarder is from Schneider Electric. Uh, this one's locally inside your network. Uh, in this case, on the local laptop. Uh, and this displays the state of the physical process. So this is talking about SCADA pack 32. Um, on this SCADA pack, we only have wired in at the moment, the state of the auto from the PLC. Uh, you have to go physically wire these inputs. That's something we've done on this to show the demo. And this talks to the SCADA pack over Modbus. Uh, we can also do DMP3. We haven't configured it on this box yet, but for our large scale for the water plant, uh, we do use DMP3 as well on this. Um, and you can see in this old video here, uh, as we turn off the auto state on the box, so I'm just putting that off on the HMI, uh, you can see the state on that software changing uh, as an alarm. And then when we acknowledge that, it disappears and with the state. We then have Kep Server EX. Um, so on the left here, we have Kep Server. It doesn't do much um, visually. And it's just a Wireshark, live Wireshark stream of the Kepware to Finwich traffic. Uh, so this from Kepware, this is a data historian, and um, again, was locally, you put an instance of this in each individual PLC site. Um, this directly talks to the Siemens PLCs and reads the data tags from them. So it's reading variables off your devices directly about once every second, and then it pushes them out to wherever you need to. In this case, Bing works. Uh, this talks to Bing works over HTTP. Um, the default is to not use HTTPS. You can turn that on, but you have to go and push a button and install a certificate. Uh, we haven't done that here. And finally, we have Finworks. So Finworks is from PTC. We now also own Kepware. Um, and this is the cloud industrial IT platform. Uh, this came to us on Ubuntu, uh, running on side Tomcat server. Uh, and this came as a pre-built VM. So they gave us the VM from the vendor. We literally put it into our VM into vSphere, booted it up, and then it worked. We didn't do any modifications and settings or install any software ourselves into this. Uh, so this receives data from Kepware, and then you can go use this to build uh, applications, web-based applications as these mashups. So this is a basic one that I set up um, to just count how many blocks is that count state. So you see as the box going through the conveyor belt, after about a second delay, that will update the count on there as well. At the moment, we only use this to read values. You can use this to control processes as well. You can push values back down to Kepware, and then Kepware can push values to the PLCs. Uh, but we don't do that in this case. So what's the attack going to show? Uh, so first, we're going to compromise our IoT platform, Bing works. Um, we're then going to create a network environment stage of the attack. Uh, we're going to do some reconnaissance on the network. Uh, we're going to mask the attack, and then we're going to manipulate the process. Uh, so this kind of follows the normal cyber kill chain here. So we have compromise reconnaissance. Uh, this process is about three stages of reconnaissance in the full attack of reconnaissance and exploiting. So you would be pivoted around a bit here to get through the network. So first off, um, to compromise the cloud platform, I said it's one on the Ubuntu on top of Tomcat 8.5. Uh, we're going to skip this step because Tomcat 8.5 is incredibly vulnerable. Uh, these CVEs are taken from the beginning of last year. We have updated the slides since then. And this is showing two critical uh, 10 high level vulnerabilities. There are mediums and there's a lot of low as well. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities known to Tomcat that can let you compromise the machine through that. So we're going to skip that step and we just installed our task group directly onto the Tomcat machine on there. So first off, what we're going to do is we're going to terminate Thingworks and kill that process. So all that task is going to do here is literally kill the Tomcat process the machine. And see, as that's done, now ThingWorks has lost all its data inputs. It just goes blank. It doesn't do much else. And if we look at Kep, uh, Kep server while this is running, um, so in the background, I'm killing the process for uh, ThingWorks. You'll see Wireshark would suddenly turn red, and Kepler starts throwing a bad message saying it can't talk to ThingWorks anymore. And this is where your operator starts to panic a bit and go, what's going on? I lost my data stream. Uh, and it's all gone red. We're now going to give ourselves a connection down into this environment for the attacker. 
So we're going to start a listener, HTTP listener on Bigworks VM. Uh, this is the Metasploit's plugin listener. And then our engineer is going to open a PDF file that we've put onto that machine. Uh, this malicious PDF um, is going to open a HTTP tunnel back out to us and give us a HTTP session we can use then to communicate down. So if we see this working, um, I'm going to start the listener first on the server, so that's ready and running. And I'll take a few seconds to boot up. That's our listening. Uh, you can see now the white shots on green because there is a HTTP server there. Uh, the packets aren't being dropped anymore. And then our operator on the Kepler machine at the local site is open this PDF file, which we place there, the Kepler manual. Uh, the SK for some messages um, to open it, and then he can go and browse that file as he normally would. Uh, but if you look down at the, the HTTP listener, that's now got a connection back from that PDF file. Uh, again, that is a malicious PDF we put there. It's a very basic one. We can make a lot cleaner one. That's just one that makes it work for their purposes. And then we go and we launch our proxy, our uh, attack script using proxy chains. And now anything that attack script does is going to be proxied down from ThingWorks, down to Kepware, and correct the Kepware machine. So our script now has direct access to all the devices within the network. So the next step is sort of the first step in any uh, attack is to do some reconnaissance. Uh, so we're going to start with doing some MMAP port scans, as you always would. Uh, they're going to enumerate the PLCs directly to find out information about the devices themselves. And we're also going to try and pull the logic off so we can know what these devices are doing. So first step is MMAP, and this will run and take a few seconds. Uh, this has been very cut down to just do four IP addresses and three ports on each, because it takes a long time over the proxy. It's slowed down quite substantially. So when this comes out, we should see four devices. You can see some ports coming out. So here we have three devices, uh, 9900, 101. The whole have port 102 open, which is uh, S7, which is the Siemens protocol. And then the bottom device, we also have uh, the Modbus protocol open, and that is our card pack. Sorry. Pause the video. There we go. So, you then run uh, two different scripts. So this is a script called PLC Scan, which is available on GitHub. Uh, it's now a bit outdated, no longer works, but it does work for older Siemens devices. And all this does is it pulls the device for its identifiable information and it's to the Siemens devices give this information up freely with the SM protocol. The key parts here are the module and hardware number at the top, the 60S7. Uh, that is a Siemens product code. So every single Siemens device uh, has a unique product code uh, that represents that. And we also have the firmware version 2.7.1. So if you know the hardware and firmware version, then you can go to a vulnerability database and find a list of all the known vulnerabilities from that. We also here have some other values, which are the name of the PLC and the name of the module. So here, this is ET200S station one, and the name of the module is ET200S. Uh, these are both set by the operator. The operator sets this is values, um, and these could be quite descriptive. These could say, um, for example, the ET200S on our water plant says ET200S pump control because that is what it's doing. And that helps the attacker try and figure out what this process is doing here. Yeah. We can also run a similar script uh, on the new devices, uh, which is now built into MMAP, which is derived from PLC scan. Um, so this is the S7 info NSC script. Uh, and that provides the same information both for the new devices in a slightly printed format. So again, we have the hardware versions uh, and the firmware versions. And finally, we're gonna put a copy of the logic of the 200. So on the older Siemens devices, you can directly read the logic function blocks from the device. Uh, so that's now read 65,000 bytes of logic. You'd have to go and manually process, but you could try and parse out uh, from there. On all Siemens devices though, if you have the Siemens tier portal software, uh, if you can connect to a device over the network, which you can here, uh, the Siemens software itself does let you pull a copy of the source code from a device because the Siemens PLC store a copy of the source code alongside the compiled logic as well. So now we know what devices there are, um, and we know what types of devices there are, we know the Siemens, um, and we could get an idea of what it's doing from the logic, if we can reverse engineer, we can actually go and attack this process. So there's two sets we're gonna do here. We're gonna both mask the attack, so we hide ourselves from the operators, and we're gonna mess with the process below it. The first thing we're gonna do is we can figure the RTU. So the RTU is reading data from the process and pushing it out to the top end, uh, we're gonna break that. So 
this is a now published vulnerability, but um, this is a closed source proof of concept. Uh, and all this is doing is a replay attack on the network stack of this device, which is changing the IP address. So we send the attack packet over. Uh, the clear scatter has quite about a 10, 15 second delay on reading data from the process. So in about 10 seconds, you should see uh, this process changed to failed and the auto turn pink. There we go. This operator can no longer talk to the process. So they can't see what's going on down there. And now we're going to attack this process. So we can both attack the HMI to be the value. So the HMI is not going to show anything different to normal. We're going to force the conveyor belt into maintenance mode. So it's pretty manual control. So it won't source anything. Um, and then hopefully blocks it to go off the end. So we start running the attack. And all this is doing is using the SM protocol to write overwrite variables on the device repeatedly. So it's here printing out, which is repeatedly writing variable to the device again and again and again, faster than the device writes itself. And we put the block on then, so it's not going to be pushed off on the first arm. If we pass the arm, it's going to go off and tie to the bucket at the end. I'll just show you a slightly wider angle view of this, so you can see the HMI as well. So same process again, run the attack put the block on and you can see the HMI is also in any box moving uh, and it's also still showing that we're running in we like here means we're running in auto mode the HMI, even though we have changes now uh, we have had a student play about this a bit see what they can do with this same attack so here's a few other ways we can mess with the process so first off we're going to make it missort so we're going to take it to whatever block it sees we're going to push it off the one piston onto piston number three so we put a block on now. We're going to put the large block on, which should be pushed off into the first packet. Uh, our mission script is made off as being large. It's going to go and push it off into one bucket. So this could be used to introduce a manufacturing defect in the process of doing this. Uh, we're also going to make a pusher into a puller. So we're going to pull a block off instead of push a block off. So we can attack the middle block, that's when it works best on. Uh, and now might as well work out the timing, so we're going to push that too early and then that piston is going to go and pull the block off the end. And finally, which is probably the most simple one, but also I think one of the most fun ones, um, we're going to make it go the wrong way. And the fair button is going to pull the block off the other end. Or stop just before. And so we've had the fitting process there. Um, in that one, we've messed with the manufacturing process. If we do this on a water plant, again, we over-pressurize the system and disable the safety mechanism. So it goes uh, above the normal safety range. Uh, and we say, OK, this is where we blow up the plant there. Uh, one more thing we can do with this box is the old 8200s in there. They're very vulnerable to a packet of death replay. So we can set a replay attack against this to put, convert the PLC into stop mode. And that's to this is then bricked until a first person physically walks up to it. So we can see it here. You can see currently it's running in green fun mode here. I will ask that packet over. That changes to orange, and the only way to fix that is to walk up to that box, flick that switch down, and pick it up again. You can't do that remotely. Um, if that's in a remote station somewhere, uh, for example, in a water company, uh, that might be an hour and a half drive for somebody to go and pick a switch off and on again. Once you find out that is a problem. So, to wrap up in almost perfect timing, I think. Um, so, this is designed for shared access, um, both for people to come and use this in its entirety by itself. Uh, or to combine test results with others. So um, there are various remote access ways available or physical access in the future, hopefully, uh, if this all fires wraps up. Uh, so we can give you access to the full test bed or to smaller parts of the test bed if you only need to get some certain devices. Uh, we could put those online just to scan those. Uh, I've had a teacher box in my kitchen for the last four months for students to do projects on um, over their little open VPN. Uh, if you do want to use this, um, the best contact is Oase. Uh, that's his email there, or myself, uh, or you can also email Bar if you speak to Barney as well at some point. Uh, we can arrange this. This is very much a collaboration, so um, there is no charge structure at the moment, but we want more to collaborate with people on using this test thread and get papers out from this. Um, so there are three papers that describe this in detail. I've tried to get this as high level as possible. So uh, the main one is the Craig Satel reference architecture for IIT and industrial control system test beds. That is a very deep dive into how the test bed is designed and works. Uh, the Oops I Did It Again paper we presented last year, this is very much a 
this is what happened when we built this testbed paper and also goes into details about the technical aspects and operation uh, and also a this paper from last year's Quitus keynote that also talks about um, testbed and that has the right to put that attack I just showed you there as well in there and that is it uh, you've got the questions thank you <laughs>